But first, the big piece of news that occurred earlier this week is the passing of Mike Nichols, truly one of our legendary directors. And uh, we wanted to spend uh, a substantial amount of time during this show to address his passing and what his, uh, what his legacy of work means to the world of film uh, before we get to the Blu-ray releases. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey. So Mike Nichols, 83 years old. Uh, you know, we had just posted on our Facebook page, it was the anniversary of Karen Silkwood's death slash murder. Um, and so I, I had posted something about that the other week. Uh, and then I had just, I'd been reading stuff about uh, actors talking about working with Mike Nichols, and then and then he passes. I mean, he was always always present in the movie scene as one of the, I mean, one of our great versatile uh, filmmakers and also mm-hmm. contribution to the stage, of, of course. But uh, when you guys think my nickels, what are the first movies or images that come to you? Well, I mean, I think obviously The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, Those are obviously the two. Yeah, uh, and I would throw in, car- uh, for me personally, I would throw in Carnal Knowledge. Just oh, yeah, Carnal still- Knowledge. But it's not just that. You really, if you look at the whole resume, Look at the whole, just the cinematic. Not the TV stuff is incredible too, though. That's the funny thing. The TV stuff is groundbreaking within itself. Angels and American Witch. But if you look at the whole filmography, even the lesser stuff, and I think the lesser stuff is only there's really primary colors and what planet are you from? Are still That's not, like, primary colors is not a lesser movie. That's a great movie. Uh, oh, I but I, I, I would not, throw I would throw in lesser like to be something like Wolf or something, but. Well, yeah. I would put in Wolf, maybe, but I think Wolf has gotten better. But <laughs> yeah. Primary Colors is Primary Colors just doesn't work as well as it should. But it, I still think it's a lesser movie. Um, and I also think that the only, but the only one that's truly lesser is What Planet Are You From? I mean, that's the only one I can really come out and say that it, it's funny, but it's not. You know, you watch it, you're like, yeah, haha. But that you know, I watched it last. I watched it this year because our friend uh, Jason Miller really likes it, and uh, and I I was not as um, I was not as put off by that movie as I guess everybody well, else was. I, th- I thought it off. had some g- interesting things in it. I think the key the the, the, the key to that movie is Linda Tarantino. You take her out. Yeah. You don't have a well, movie. the big problem I'm, with that with Planet uh, with what Planet is, it's just not as funny as you wish it would. Well, you know, you know course, that's no, the problem. That's true. But it's you know you bring up Wolf and everything. It's the stuff with Jack Nicholson that's really his contributions um, with Jack Nicholson are, are. I mean, Harper and I think it is a superb movie. Um, I also think that Carnal Knowledge. I think that Carnal Knowledge is the first movie I ever saw with Jack Nicholson. Um, so I mean that's a, that's a well. Very this is my question. Movie. This is my question about Mike Nichols, in terms of carnal knowledge, because this is fascinating to me. How do you think? Because I I love carnal knowledge, and I also love Closer. And mm-hmm. here he is. Here he is examining kind of sexual politics, uh, but but a generation apart. And do do you think that's a that makes for a great double feature? And what do you think he reveals differently between those two generations? Mm. Mm, that's a good question, what? and I saw that when you posted that. I would have to, I, you know, they're re- in, in some ways they're the the same movie. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you could say that Clive Owen is, has the Jack Nicholson part, and Jude Law has the Art Garfunkel part. I mean, I think they're two alike. Like that's, I I wouldn't want to see a double feature of those two movies. They'd be it'd be I guess it'd be interesting in sort of like a filmic or film study sort of way, but like as 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 a viewer, you would be just comparing the two too much. And uh, I I I don't think that Closer says anything deeper than Cardinal Knowledge did. And and I'm not well. I don't I, I don't think it does either. But, uh, I, but I didn't recognize it, anything it, different about it really. Like if, if, if it does if it if it does say the same thing, then that's actually saying something. If if mm-hmm. sexual politics has not changed in these forty yeah. years, then that yeah. that could be the point but, of what he yeah. You know. I, I want to Maybe. bring up some something though. Um, he did, you know, for I would in 1988 he made Biloxi Blues, which is probably I think the best of Neil Simon adaptation there is, um, if you want to know the honest truth. And then he does Working Girl, and let's you know, 
Working Girl, I think, actually contains one of Harrison Ford's best performances. I won't lie to you. I, I think he's wonderful in that movie. And it's certainly Melanie Griffith's one of her best performances. Um, and that's a really smart movie and a very funny movie. And he does these two movies in the same year, and, and they're just... You know, well, look, he was he was great at casting, and and, and he he was great at casting, uh, and kind of f- forming a different uh, feeling about an actor in his casting. And let's let's be frank. I mean, if you want to look at the actors that we all love from the '70s, the quote unquote non leading man that actually mm-hmm. became the leading men at the time, the outside the box leading man. Uh, you have Mike Nichols to thank for that, because right. he's the one that cast Dustin Hoffman in the Robert Redford role in The Graduate. I mean, it was written for a Robert Redford type. That was how right. it was kind of imagined, and he had the balls to say, "No, I, I want Dustin Hoffman." <laughs> that that changed a lot. Uh, it really did in '68. What was it? '68 mm-hmm. or '60? Yeah, '67. '67. And actors adored him. I mean, actors just loved him. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely correct. You know, we're we're uh, we're, we're uh, you know, I mean, like the seventies would not look the guy the, with those two movies with Virginia Woolf and The Graduate. He changed cinema, really, basically. He changed the direction of cinema. Um, it was already sort of veering towards those uh, a more you know open kind of thing, but uh, he's the one that really cracked it open. And the fact that he was, you know, totally embraced by Hollywood for doing that, you know, I mean, Virginia Woolf got 13 Academy Award nominations, The Graduate got 10 and won him his only Best Director Oscar. So, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, so it was obvious that Hollywood was ready to go that way and and was, and I mean, he was he was the one who did it. And I mean, but, you, you know, uh, it's just there's no other way to say it. Well, well, At least in say, America. Yeah, I want to say this though: his last movie that he directed, his last feature film, Charlie Wilson's mm-hmm. War, was very good. It doesn't get the credit it deserves, but it no, actually it's is good. A very, it's mm-hmm. a superb film. It also contains, I mean, a very funny uh, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman performance, but all, a great Tom Hanks performance, and it, it's a very good everybody's movie. good in it. Everyone is yeah. superb, and it's, you know people don't talk about it. But you really think, wow, you, you know, everyone is, you know. Last year we were talking about a year, a year ago. To, you know, we were talking about how, you know, Martin Scorsese has lost none of his vigor with Wolf of Wall Street. You could have said the same thing about Charlie Wilson's War with Mike Nichols. He's lost nothing. There is nothing there that you know that's not as sharp as it was in something as brilliant and underrated as Catch-22. And let's face it, Catch-22 is a very good adaptation of a very funny, if not difficult, book. I remember yeah, I, I love, love Catch-22 as well. I, I remember it's reading superb. about Catch-22 in the Biskind book, uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, and, yeah. and Mike Nichols, actually, I mean, they had a lot of hopes on Catch-22. And their thunder was kind of swiped by MASH. And uh, Nichols actually... <laughs> Uh, Nichols actually watched MASH in the theater, and he knew. He was like, we thought we were doing something groundbreaking, but then look at this. Look at MASH. And, oh, my God. And uh, I, apparently Altman, good-naturedly, because I think everyone liked Mike Nichols. I think the only person that doesn't like Mike Nichols is Bill Clinton. Um, but, uh, uh, and, that, and that's what – well, that's what Mike Nichols said, that Bill Clinton's the only person that he knows of that doesn't like him. But uh, – with, uh, Altman even had a poster in his office that said "Caught 22" when he released a uh, match. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. no, yeah, and that's a good. I didn't. I didn't see Catch 22 until I guess in in my 20s um, after reading the book, and um, it's a really good film. And it, I mean, no but it, how how is it, it in comparison? Can I, let me stop you. Can I ask you this? How, how is it in comparison with the book? I mean, because a lot of people who I know who have read the the book uh, d- don't really care for the movie. But um, so why would that be? Like why? Well, why because would you... I, I think it's a it's a hard thing to adapt, um, and they may not have. I do see. The, I can see why you wouldn't like the book. It's, I mean, I guess the, the closest thing the analogy you can make is trying to adapt Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow into a movie, and good luck with that. Um, you know, but 
Um, and I've never, I, I can't even, I, the, the idea of trying to read Gravity's Rainbow today is quite frightening because it's a, it's a very dense book. Um, but going back to Catch-22, he, he's, I guess one of these, these books, the sacred books like Catcher in the Rye, even though it's never been made into a movie, it kind of has been made into a movie with other um, other movies in the sense, you know, that owe its very existence to Catcher in the Rye. So here you have something that actually goes ahead and makes Catch-22, and it works. I don't see what people have a problem with. Um, you know what I would, you know, can I be a broken record? Say, I wish Mike Nichols would have made the sequel, Closing Time. Mm. Even though it's not a great, it's not a great, you know, book, I would have loved to have seen everyone come back who was who could and be in it, Alan Arkin especially. Um, well, he's there's, great there's also, Joe Sarian. There's also the stage work, and, I, and you know, when... And and he's he's suffered. I mean, he was close to two actors that died. I mean, essentially, they both killed themselves. Uh, one accidentally, but uh, in Philip Seymour Hoffman and Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the last piece of theater he directed was the Death of a Salesman with with Hoffman. Mm-hmm. And they just said that that was a, like a like a earth shattering production of that really spared down. I think they went back to the original uh, original production uh, design uh, from whenever that was written decades ago. Um, and he, I mean, he really and he directed Spam a lot, and he really was. Uh, he, I think he won a Tony for Salesman. Actually, that was his won. last Tony award. I mean, like he won he won you know eight Tonys. So I mean, uh, for like the real thing, and uh, with Jeremy Irons, and I mean he he was you know, uh, you know he, he was uh, well I mean he was he was big in every in every medium I mean in the in the sixties you know of course with Elaine May you know uh, uh, on on stage um, yeah uh, on uh, you know Arthur Penn directed their. Uh, Sort of their Broadway review, uh, and uh, and then they were huge on television as a team as well. I mean, you can go on YouTube, and this when I found out that he passed away, instead of going to his movies, actually, I actually went on YouTube, and uh, somebody has set up a channel that has uh, all of the TV uh, appearances of uh, Mike Nichols and Elaine May. So I, I wanted to go and take a look at some of that stuff, and that stuff is just. It's just brilliant, and you really get a a sense of what he's. Well, you get the sense of what he's like as a performer, and also, also you also get a sense of uh, of the setting up of the breaking down of of sexual taboos and so forth that that came to fruition in in the first two movies uh, and in Carnal Knowledge as well. So right, uh, so you really <clears throat> that that was the first thing that I did because I had really never jumped into that stuff and and uh and it made me want to listen to some of the records i also watched the uh, american masters uh thing on uh elaine may and and mike nichols and and uh in that they play some of the records which he also won a grammy for those so he's one of the few people who's won an emmy a grammy yeah. a tony and uh, yeah, yeah he's won all four yeah. what do they call it like uh, a like a, yeah like an egot or something yeah okay and yeah. got yeah so uh, but uh, uh, but he was huge in every single medium in re- in, in television, records, stage, uh, movies. Uh, you know, it's just uh, unbelievable. You know what yeah. what a career. And um, I think it really built. It, a, hang on, Adams here. Hang on, Adam. Hey, bud. Hey guys, how are you? Hey. Hey, Adam. We're talking. We're talking Mike Nichols here. I I, I assumed as much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, I've been. Bro, I, that's that's been terrible. We we've, we've been discussing that for the last couple of days. All my close friends and I. It's uh, it's awful, but you know, a full life though. Well, yeah, a really full life, and everybody yeah. everybody loved him. I mean, and uh, all the all the recollections of him that I read. I mean, Pacino said it was the best director he'd ever worked with, and um, you know, lots of people have come come out. Everybody loved him. He he he, there, he never raised his temper. He was so even on the set and 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 loving and nurturing, and he had a beautiful life and as rich and varied and fulfilling a career as you could imagine. And he died at the age of eighty three. I mean, there's a roundtable 
uh, the director roundtable on Hollywood Reporter, and the news had just broke that Mike Nichols had died before they started taping the roundtable. And uh, so they brought it up, and Bennett Miller is one of the people in the roundtable, and he said uh, that he's really he was really close to Mike Nichols. He started crying, actually, as he started speaking, and Bennett Miller isn't kind of like outwardly emotional kind of person. Right. But he But he said, you know, just yesterday I texted him like three different times. Uh, mm. And you know, and then he just died suddenly of a heart attack hours later. Um, so it was a big shock for a lot of people. But that life—I mean, what a what a what a full life! You you have to be happy with that legacy. Mm-hmm. And a career that and a and a career that just uh, stayed uh, completely relevant all the way to the to the very end. I mean, it was only. It was only last year or maybe a year before that, that he was uh, doing, you know, Death of a Salesman on Broadway. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's like it's it's ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's still a Bye. tremendous loss, though, because you, uh, you, I still, you know, whenever somebody passes away like this, you know, I think, you know, uh, no more no more work by them. You know, yeah, no, uh, it's a sad, it's a sad thing, and especially someone who you know I'm sure could have done it, you know, at least one or two more films at least. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that's another thing too. It's interesting, like you know, a lot of times when older when older uh, people are, are in the business, you know, they kind of get left behind, kind of, and uh, nobody was prepared to leave him behind. Uh, uh, they they always were willing to embrace him, mainly because I guess because actors, uh, in particular, just loved him so uh, that they would they would go to the ends of the earth to to do things with him. So, yeah. well, what's your favorite? A, what's your favorite, Adam? Uh, Nichols. Fan? God, I don't know. I mean, there's so many. I mean, The Graduate, Carnal Knowledge. Um, you know, even some of the ones in the uh, '90s, like Wolf, have. I mean, that's not my favorite. Wolf, it's, it's not your favorite, but it's. It, I think the idea and what it talks about, though. Like I remember talking yeah. about that with a lot of friends. You know, while the execution may not be, you know, perfect, it's that at least it, it, what it wants to tackle is very interesting. I well, think. the art direction is amazing in Wolf. Uh, the set decoration is just in that office with the like the caged yep. elevators, and I just love that. Well, you know that's a real that's a real uh, that's the Bradbury Building in in L. A. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. so that's been used in tons of movies. So, but uh, but it's a yeah, great location. I'm glad they I'm glad they used it in that <laughs> because yeah, no, no, because, no, it, I... because it says something about. Uh, about that character and about you know the 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 wolf alter ego and yeah. you know mm-hmm. thematically right to yeah. do it in that building. Yeah, I even his face. failures were were interesting failures. I think um, yeah, all of them. I mean, yeah, there wasn't anything that you. I mean, he didn't make films that you could say you know well, but gosh, that's you know there's nothing in there that makes it worth seeing. There was always something to me anyway you, that, that made you were films curious. Better. You were always yeah, curious right. what he would do. But I want to say this though, we're talking. Because there's this whole thing that, you know, being a film director for the most part is one of these jobs you can do up till the day you die. Um, if you can get behind the camera, if you have, you know, a certain level, I guess, of credibility and respect, you can basically do this well into your 80s or 90s as long as you're health. And he was one of these guys that would have gone till the very end. I mean, he, if he could have, he would have, you know, if he didn't, you know, it's very sudden. This is a cardiac arrest in the middle of the night. Well, of course, he, got, he was working on another film. As yeah, the, uh, yeah, but they, I mean, he was, yeah, so. If you have the talent, because what I'm trying to say here is if you have the talent and you have the, not even the energy, but if you have stamina. the talent and the, crea- the stamina, you can do this till the day you die. This is where I violently disagree with Tarantino. Oh, I don't want to be like the Hitchcock of Family Plot. Dude, you should be so lucky that you get that old and be able to make Family Plot, first of all. Um I you totally know, agree. Yeah, we've talked about this on the show. You know, yeah. the vast majority, the vast majority of directors don't have, don't have the stamina to work, at least it, to to do the same level of work that made them great. Even I'm talking about the great directors now, the same level of of stamina to. But it's not even stamina. Know. It's just it's one of these jobs that I do think 
if you, first of all, I guess in today's day and age, if you can get the, the, the first of all, the money, the backing, and the distribution, but you can do it. For, I just think he's one of these, Nichols is one of these guys who could, um, you know, like you said, he's working on another film, but he could could have, could have gone on for, I think there, there are at least two more films there. Um, there are several directors like that. Um, mm-hmm. And then there are some of the other directors who we've interviewed who just kiss and moan that they won't, do certain films, and I think if you if you, if you have the if you're allowed to get behind the camera, I don't care what it is. Just try to make it the best you can. Um, but Mike Nichols was well. One ideally, of we were, ideally, you would think that the older you get, uh, the more interesting things you have to say. I yes. mean, because because our, our artists kind of feed on their life experience, and yes. the more life experience mm-hmm. you have under your belt, the the more you have to share. Uh, and you know, but he he was extremely uh, versatile. I mean, he he could do the birdcage, and then he could do closer. I mean, come on, <laughs> wit, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great movie. I was gonna say that's a great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I you know, amongst his, uh, I I don't know if this is a. This is just a movie that I don't hear people talking about, uh, even though he got an Oscar nomination for it for Best Director. But Silkwood, to me, is like it. right after those first three that I mentioned, Virginia Woolf will always be my favorite of his mm-hmm. movies. Uh, Graduate, absolutely number two. Carl Knowledge, absolutely number three. But then I go to the number four, and then it has to be Silkwood. And I just right. and then and then for me, number five would be Primary Colors. That's how great I think Primary Colors is. Uh, but um, uh, but Silkwood, Silkwood to me is just devastating, and and, and it's also a movie that feels. Uh, well, it's a movie that takes place in a completely different place than any of his mm-hmm. other movies do. It's really the only movie that he ever did that takes place in the South. Um, so I think that's an interesting. Well, I guess Biloxi Blues too, Biloxi. but a lot of the well, characters Biloxi weren't Blues, Southern. I was ranked higher. Yeah, well, they weren't. It wasn't a movie. It takes it. place in the South, but it's not a movie about the South. Let's put it that way. Uh, so, uh, so Silkwood to me felt like a movie. Uh, that was uh, that was about working class people, and uh, and for me, it just feels completely different from any of his other movies. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, and 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 it doesn't just feel different because of those subject uh, matters too, or or the setting, but also there's a certain sort of quietude to it um, mm-hmm. that feels different, um, and uh, and and. There's also like a certain sort of, oh, like a dire sort of seriousness that uh, uh, very he very rarely touched on. I think he did in in the other movies that I mentioned that are some of my favorites. But uh, but but there's something about that film, you know, and about that that woman's story and everything mm-hmm. uh, that just really really resonates with me. And uh, and I think it should be. Uh, it should be in the conversation as one of his greatest movies. I guess that's what I'm saying. I think so. I think so too. I mean, that was the. Fr- yeah, I love Postcards from the Edge too, but I, I think of I think about Silkwood often. I mean, actually, that was the <clears throat> the first movie we mentioned tonight in relation to Mike Nichols. Uh, right. Uh, so it's a yeah, it is, it's a very powerful movie. I'll always remember Pauline Kael's negative review of it because I, I just <laughs> thought she was so, she was so off pace in that review. Did Altman give Cher her first? Yeah, Altman gave Cher her first break, and then she followed that up with Silkwood. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just the year later. Yeah. yeah, Silkwood was a big deal. I mean, I, you know, Silkwood is a very important movie. I would say Silkwood, you know, after the China Syndrome, really, really a bad. You know, you talk about double features you don't want to do, but that's quite a double. That's, feature. That would make a great double bill, I think. <laughs> I think that would make a great double bill. Mm-hmm. So what and what else? The and China, China Syndrome. syndrome. Mm-hmm. Well, it does play. Yeah, it's it's like the it's like a, the corporate whistle. I mean, there's a whole subgenre of corporate whistleblowers. <laughs> whistleblowers. <laughs> well, know, what is the from, error to from, from that to the insider to yeah. I mean, Aaron Brockovich would be the obvious heir to Silkwood. You couldn't have Aaron Brockovich without Silkwood, I don't think. You know what's interesting about Mike Nichols, though? Let me just, I'm looking at his career, you know, 22 movies, uh, including one short, one documentary, and two TV movies. Uh, And uh, I'm sitting here looking at his career, and as great as he was and everything, and as great as Catch-22 and Carnal Knowledge is, 1970, 1971, 
he really wasn't there in the 70s c- contributing a whole lot to the 70s um you know that well, golden era outside, that we all... outside of cardinal outside of cardinal knowledge and the graduate it, it was because he su- that's when he really started suffering major setbacks and mm-hmm. he uh and one after another just wouldn't fly with for him like the day of the dolphin and the fortune and catch 22 didn't succeed and he had and guild alive but i want to say the, uh, the, but, the but it really Radner set movie. him it really set him back uh and yeah. so he he had to sit on kind of the sidelines through that whole period yeah. it Can really I... feels like he's kind of gone from 73 until 83 like he's like just doing stage work and stuff like really but yeah, i mean it's, uh, the, it's the failures that movies. set him back it's like altman it's like altman in the early 80s i think the same thing uh-huh. happened to Mike Nichols in the same. but the day of the dolphin and especially the fortune let's be honest you, the, th- the four of us would be lined up if warm baby and jack Nicholson did another film We'd yeah, I think that was, also, that was the problem. That that's, was the problem with the fortune because Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson were lined up, and they were ready ready to make the movie. They just didn't have a movie. That, no, they didn't have a movie. But yeah. we would be lined up to see another movie with those two. We would love to see a movie with those two. Right. Well, now. actually, to tell you the truth, to this day, I've still never seen the fortune because it's never. I mean, has, Adam, you could answer this. Has this ever gotten a major release? On, yes, on, it's on Blu-ray. It's on Blu-ray. It Twilight is? Time. Yeah, the company uh, that never like releases that. anything that anyone wants to see, according to Adam. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I see? But the Day of the Dolphin, even though it's not a popular movie, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. I can remember you talking about Day of the Dolphin with William Fraker, uh, the right. DP of it. That's right. <clears throat> so yeah. That's another film that I think I've only seen parts of, you know, Day of the Dolphin. Uh, Bean, so, can I say something? Bean, can yeah. I just say something about Day of the Dolphin? You haven't lived until your old, older brother quotes from Day of the Dolphin when you're, like, in the 70s, okay? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I remember hilarious. people quoting it because of, uh, what was the dolphin's name? Fa like Loves the, B. Oh, Fa yeah, Fa Loves, loves B, B is the famous <laughs> Right, yeah. So I, I people did that did uh, resonate with people back in the seventies. Like, yes, especially my kids brother was one reason. of them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it did. It's interesting okay. too that in this after Silkwood, you know, if you look at his career after Silkwood, it's primarily all comedy movies. Like until I mean, Heartburn, Biloxi Blues, Working Girls, Postcards from the Edge. Maybe not regarding Henry, but uh, but no. you know, I mean, and Wolf a little. But Birdcage, Primary Colors, even. It's like a large amount of comedy work, so he has to be considered one of the great comedy directors of all time as well. Because, oh, I uh, would, I would think, so. yeah, without a doubt. You know, and I mean that makes sense from where he came from. Well, where he was he known from it, with yeah. Elaine May. So, yeah. uh, but, but imagine uh, like breaking in, like your first movie being Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. So your first you movie, that? you're you're, you're I, there directing Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. <laughs> I know. I mean, that's insane. You're like that, in the middle. You're in the middle of the maelstrom, and furthermore, to have it done and complete, and then just when you look at it, it's just such a total knock out of knock out of the park. It's just it's so ridiculous how great that. Can movie I ask is. a question though, chron- chronology wise? Is that the first? Burton Taylor marriage, or is this the second Burton Taylor marriage? And that's, it's, it's uh, the they got first divorced one. and then remarried. It's the first one because they got divorced oh and God. remarried like back in the seventies. So this is this is the this is the Cleopatra marriage. Oh my God! <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. That would have been the greatest the greatest to be a fly on the wall during the making of that movie. I mean, and I'm plus, sorry. they were both working at the. I mean, I think after after Cleopatra, they were really, really, and, and some of the other things that they would do because they did some other movies that weren't so great together. But uh, but I think they were really hungry to do something that was that would really um, that yeah. would really uh, it, resonate it, it, it with really, people. It, it really showed Elizabeth Taylor completely ravaged. I mean, that was which is mm-hmm. uh, was different from the glamour. Liz Taylor that we were accustomed to prior to that. Here's, here's a double feature for you. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf and the VIPs? Then get back to me. <laughs> That's another one I've never seen. I've never seen the VIPs. Oh, I've never seen, like, movie. the Sandpiper. Is that something that they did together? I um, don't know off the top of my head, but... Here's a double feature for you. The, v, the VIPs and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. How about... Uh, how about uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf and V.I. Warshawski? That's uh, <laughs> I, 